And with that, let's get going. Welcome everybody to this webinar on the future of advice. My name is Philip Hecker, co-founder and CEO of Bento Engine, and I'll be your moderator today. In terms of housekeeping, we're joined today by Mark Wellman from the Bento team helping with the logistics. And I'll introduce our very special guest and dear friend, Todd Fithian, in a second. First though, in terms of housekeeping, this webinar is being recorded. And yes, we will make the replay available in a follow-up email and we'll also post it on our respective websites. In terms of the arc of today's conversation, we will do brief introductions and Todd, some icebreakers, I'm giving you a heads up warning. Then we will hand over to Todd for his perspectives on the future of advice. We'll bake in a five minute demo on the Bento Engine solution, and then we'll wrap it up with open mic and Q&A. Very eager to hear your thoughts. As we go along, please feel free to use the chat function or the Q&A function to share with us your comments or questions. We may answer them impromptu or towards the end of the conversation. Bento Engine, as you all know, is a integrated technology and content solution that helps client-centric advisors to more often do the right thing, meaning proactively provide personal, timely, impactful advice during moments that matter. That aligns thematically extremely well with the theme of today's conversation, which is the future of advice. And we're thrilled to have today with us Todd Fithian, best-selling author. You all may recall his 07 book, The Right Side of the Table, and well-known and respective industry consultant, speaker, and growth helper. Todd, I always, when I introduce you, feel like I underrepresent you. So why don't you briefly say hello to the crew, introduce yourself and the multiple hats that you're so effectively wearing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, thank you to the Bento team for having us here today. It's uh, we're, we're excited to be here and share some of our kind of latest thoughts and insights. Um, you know, by way of background, I, I started in this business as an advisor, as like most or many of you that are participating and listening in today or in the future. Um, and then uh, later developed what I run today, the legacy companies, which is really a training uh, and coaching and, and even consulting um, uh, business for financial advisors and financial institutions with a real focus on, on advisor growth. Um, lots of people are saying that today around advisor growth and, and really our focus around that is for some of our clients, it's about growth and revenue, right? It's a real revenue focused growth. For others, it's really about the people, the process, the systems. How do we replicate what we do well so that we can increase capacity? And then the third component is really around uh, the the growth with clients. We've got existing relationships. And I think, again, where, where Bento and, and I are so aligned is, right, this is a real opportunity to expand and grow with relationships. And we do a lot of work on that on a generational uh, basis. Um, you know, with clients. So yeah, been around a long time, nearly 30 years now, and uh, just just love helping advisors uh, achieve new heights and grow. And uh, that's what we're here for today. Wonderful to have you. Great background. Appreciate the vantage point that you bring to the table. Before we dive in and hand over for you for your perspectives, let's get to know you a little bit better a few <laughs> quick fire, rapid fire, icebreaker type of questions. You ready, Todd? I hope so. <laughs> favorite food? Oh, favorite food. I would have to say uh, fish. Favorite book? My goodness. Um, it makes total sense uh, by Tom Hensky, reading it now around generational wealth. Um, kids, educating kids, financial literacy. Great book. Excellent. Favorite travel destination? Oh, just back from there. The the BVIs, British Virgin Islands. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Last question for now. If you could invite three people over for dinner, dead or alive, who would it be? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I don't know if mostly. Well, so one, 
I lost my brother who I started this business with 17 years ago, 100% top of the list. Uh, lost my dad nine years ago. Um, and and that's that's a killer mentor, many things in my business, in my life. My goodness, the third. Um, you know what? In my work, and I think you'll see it and hear it, uh, this may be a weird one you've never heard before, but but it might be, uh, I might say Aristotle. Very interesting. Aristotle and the Scythian family, I can only imagine that dinner party. Thanks for sharing all that. And with that thought, over to you to please share on the screen, in the voiceover, some of your perspectives on the future of advice. So if you don't mind, we see the screen share building up. Take us on a journey. I may chime in with a comment or question from time to time. Yeah. Folks on the lines, if you have comments or questions, as I mentioned, don't be shy. Use the chat functionality or the Q&A functionality. And Todd, in between, will hand over for a quick demo bento as well so that people can see how you are covering the why and the what of the future of advice. And Bento is one way to bring the how yeah. to life, actually helping advisors deliver this vision. And with yeah. that, Todd, over to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm excited to be here. And as, as um, you know, Philip has said, today's really about the future of advice and, and really client engagement. And, you know, this is a very, it's an evolving industry and the, the wants and needs and desires of consumers is, is changing rapidly, right? And we're hearing this from all of our clients across and throughout North America, uh, that clients are really demanding more from them and, and a lot of difference in the delivery and the way that they're bringing the advice, uh, you know, to those households, to those businesses. I, I do believe that for those advisors that are embracing this, and if you're here with Bento and me today, you are one of those advisors, you are one of those organizations um, that is really embracing this movement. You're looking for ways to be better and different and things of that nature. And I feel like you have the most amazing opportunity for growth in the delivery of quality advice, um, you know, for the remainder of your careers. There's so much opportunity out there to do it the right way, because unfortunately, there's way too many people out there that are, are not doing it the right way. Um what I want to talk to you about here today in the beginning, and then I'm going to give you some takeaways, but I want to talk with you about some of those shifts and what are we seeing in advisory practices and behaviors and things of this nature. As I said, I'm a trainer, I'm a coach, I'm a consultant. I am inside of uh, lots and lots of firms, you know, large RIAs to small independent practices. Uh, and and kind of everything in between. So we're seeing a lot and exposed to a lot. And what I'm going to talk with you about today is these are not things that are not happening. These things are, are here, right? This is about the future, but a lot of these things are happening uh, and are here and they're in front of us. And today for our time together, we're going to focus on the left-hand side of this. And this is a lot of, of work and research and studies that we have done across our clients, across the industry, and, and again, trends and behaviors that we're seeing that we think are important for each and every one of you to know and see and understand. And so we're going to spend our time primarily just looking at, uh, you know, what's shifting in the way that advisors are actually finding clients and what does that look like in the future? We're going to look at the shifts and the trends in client engagements and like winning those relationships and serving and what's important, um, you know, in those relationships today versus really previously. Um, and then the third part, we'll look at how advisors will serve clients. How, how will advisors be serving clients in the future? And again, I think, you know, Bento is going to tie beautifully into this. And maybe at a later date, we come back and we talk about some of these other pieces on the right hand side. But you're going to get a lot here today in our time together. And I'm a Boston guy and I'm going to go relatively fast. So I know it's being recorded and that's good. Um, so you can come back and listen to it as much and as often as you want. So um, let's jump into things here. As far as finding clients, right? What, what we're seeing is a significant shift. And over the last couple of years, 
we we've seen this uh, the the shift happening in front of us where there's much more deliberate client selection. I don't know if if you've attended or seen marketed the number of workshops around helping advisors defining your niche, right? That niche marketplace those niche opportunities that you want to pursue and engage around. There's a significant shift to getting advisory firms and teams aligned with a very specific group, because when we align with a very specific niche, we, we can we can talk directly to them and they know that we're actually talking to them. Um, the other part of this, and um, you know, I know I know Philip put in you know his favorite podcast right now is Kitz's. Um, we did a we did a an article this week. I think it was it was sent out this week from Kitz's on um, on on uh, on client introductions. And and this last point here around being more deliberate. There's a tremendous shift that's happening in the marketplace uh, away from referrals to introductions, and this is really critical for you to understand. Most of the, I've worked with lots and lots of advisors over 30 years, and, and the way I came into the business, people do not keep consistent traction and pressure around referrals, because the ways that we've been taught and trained to ask around referrals, it, it's poor, right? It's evolved. The business has evolved, but many of our approaches haven't. And so maybe look for that article from Kitsis. We give a, a, a proven model around identifying active promoters. You want to find the people that are bragging about you. And many of you know who they are in your business today, but there's others that are quietly bragging that you may not know about. And the reality is, instead of asking, you know, all 150 or 300 or whatever number of clients you have for referrals, you might only need 10 to 15, maybe 20 active promoters that can help you achieve and exceed your growth goals in your business in, in, in a year. So we found huge hey, success there. Todd, super interesting. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. How does one identify the quiet fans, the quiet, you know, ravers? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. The the active promoters that we're aware of, th these are the, you know, the phone-ins that you're getting. Hey, Philip said I should be talking to you. That's an, that's a live, vibrant, active promoter. But we have other active promoters that are totally willing to. We just have to ask. And so how we do that is with an active promoter that may be not be loud and vocal, they are value expressing, meaning you do an annual review with them and they say, you know what, Philip, I, I can't thank you and the team, your team at Bento enough. We feel so uh, that we're going in the right direction. We feel so secure and all of those things. That's a value. Now we know this is an active promoter, but they may not be sending us opportunities now. Maybe they don't know that we're, I find this interesting. Maybe they don't even know that we're actually taking on new clients. Sometimes advisors want to appear to be busy Right. And that's an okay thing, but sometimes that can be detrimental because people are like, oh, I can't send you anything else because you're too busy already. Right. So, but we have a process. We use the net promoter score uh, in a survey format to go out and, and it helps us identify who our active promoters are uh, if we're not aware. So there's, again, in that article, and I'm happy to share it with your group. Uh, maybe we just do that. Um, really, really good stuff in there. Absolutely. Let's put the article into the show notes. We'll include it in the follow-up email and post it online as well. Perfect. Yeah, let's do that. Um, you know, curate, and this just kind of piggybacks on it, but curation and creation of client groups, we're, we're finding that there's, when, when you start to focus on a niche, there, there's groups that are being curated. So for example, the favorite book I talked about was Tom Hensky's, um, it, it makes total sense. What we're finding is, is advisors are putting on workshops and experiences where they can bring in groups of clients that are interested in the same types of things. So there's definitely a curation and and uh, and creation of client types of groups that are interested in the same thing, which which a niche totally helps. Um, and then you know, listen, the world has created all kinds of ways for us to do you know prospect intelligence gathering, uh, and I'll give you just a quick example of that. This is a simple tool. Uh, you should be able to see here playing. But if you see the blue dot on my screen, this is something in our background uh, in, in our website that's playing $25 a month. And I can literally see where this who this person is, where they came from, where they went on my website, right, where they stopped, where they hung out, what they clicked on. And so it's amazing when you think about the tools that are available. This is just a simple example of that. But 
we're finding, and I might talk about it later, that 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 people are allocating resources inside their business and hiring people on their teams to really be doing prospect and and client um you know analytics to find out what what's important to them what matters to them and things of that nature so just to give you that that simple example of that technology but um you know let's let's kind of segue into um this other piece here right where we're, we're looking now at, you know, client relationships and um, really what are the important things around them? What are some of the misunderstood relationships, um, aspects of that relationship? So number one, you know, just to talk about quickly here, you know, empathy, understanding, um, you know, our reputation, these things previously were more kind of you know, table stakes for advisors. No, no longer are they just simply table stakes. These are true. And, and it's important that you're thinking about this and, and developing and designing skill sets and enhancing skill sets around these things because they're no longer table stakes. They're becoming very relevant and very important. Um, the second thing around the fact that there's a different sale, and this is really interesting. A lot of our work, and I said, you know, I'd, I'd invite Aristotle to that family dinner. You know, a lot of our work stems back to the behavioral and psychology side of, of human behavior and, and relationships. And one of the things that we're seeing a huge shift in, like different from goals, but helping people get clear on the vision that they have for the future, how they want things to be one day. And, and what we're finding is the advisor that can help people clarify that, because let's face it, they, they don't, your clients and potential clients don't have that nailed. This is the advisor that can help them define that and then help them pursue that. It's a very different type of relationship. Um, we'll talk about trust in a little bit, um, and I'm going to bring some science to it, but um Trust and relevance are new currency of client acquisition. Trust, I can't tell you how many workshops I've done on trust. I have people sitting in the audience with their arms folded and they're unengaged because we've seen so many people talk about it. And I don't think we've seen people talk about it in the way that we talk about it and we understand it. I think it's poorly understood and I think it's even more poorly executed. Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of talk to that in a bit, but it, to 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 just assume that we are the trusted uh, and we have high trust, you know, skills and approaches and things we're doing is just it's no longer enough. We really need to understand it at a much deeper level. Um, and then the last component of this just that there's a significant move towards planning. And, and we've seen this for the last number of years, right? The advice movement, the planning movement, but there are more people coming into the planning world. And so when you look at tools like eMoney or Money Guide or Asset Map or Right Capital or whatever you're using, there's a myriad of, of, of planning tools out there. What in, in what what in your planning is actually different from your competitors? And how do you know? Right? How do you know that your planning and the planning experience is different as this this thread is growing and this group is growing? is really what you need to be looking at. Because let's face it, there's lots of people out there that have smart team members that can build and create and run beautiful financial plans. But what in it is it that makes actually yours stand out and be different from others? And, and again, if I may jump in there, yeah, what's in it and how well is it being executed day in, day out? Frankly, Absolutely. both by the advisor and the investor, the client, you know, the proof is in the pudding. The traction is in the actual action. Yeah. And I think we all on this webinar have seen vast differences in the level of execution of given financial plans. Yeah. And, and even financial to a state, right? We've all seen the statistic that 70% of people in the United States don't have a will. Right. They might have a document, but they never finalized it, never signed it, never funded their trust. So just just another example there. Ab absolutely. Um, and then, you know, we'll just we'll look just for a minute around, um, you know, serving clients, you know, again, talking about Michael Kitsis and others. I mean, definitely Bento and Legacy. Right. This whole advice based movement um, is really about. Uh, the fact that clients are willing to pay for 
advice rather than simply pay for plans or pay for products. I've done work in this space for 30 years. We've helped people create significant revenue streams in their business for by getting paid for their advice, knowledge, wisdom. Huge shift. People want that separation. Um, and, and so there's there's revenue there on the table, but it's more than just about the money. It's about how it sets the relationship up in the right trajectory, in the right direction. And guess what? Even clients that are paying fees will give you an opportunity to, to solve all of their other needs as well at the same time. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Bento is a prime example of the fact that digital is becoming more human, right? Like you guys are an absolute living, breathing example. And we'll, we'll have, you know, Philip uh, give us a, an update um, on, on where they're at and what they're doing. Um, engaging the bubble and not just the client. I There is such a tremendous opportunity inside advisors practices for generational wealth and money that's in motion and all of these things. Um, I can't tell you how many times in my career I've had advisors call me up really when they were engaged with 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 uh, you know with with one decision maker in the family and they pass away and and now they can't get anybody on the phone they can't get the connection it's really the today it's about engaging the entire bubble and not just who you might perceive to be the decision maker client. Um, you know, so it's really about the family. It's about the unit. And again, that gets into a lot of the work we do in the generational wealth space. And then the last thing here, just major shift to smaller businesses. I, I, I've seen a lot in, in my time and we're, we're seeing a big migration to smaller practices, very purposeful practices, a lot of segmentation going on or what we call client clustering. And there's a lot of different ways in which to kind of approach that. But people are trying to curate smaller and better books of business and clientele, rather. I shouldn't even say books. I hate when people say that, right? It's really, these are people, these are humans. Um and so, so that we can serve them better, more dynamically, and um, and 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 really keep them keep them for life. Hey, so, Todd, before you move on, a quick build on your third point of engaging the uh, bubble, engaging the client, the entire client family. Yeah. Recently, came across a shocking data point. We all know how high the attrition is when G one passes how few of G2 retain their parents' financial advisor. According to Fidelity, only 13% of G2 clients report that the legacy advisor ever reached out to them, ever connected with them. Right. So perhaps it shouldn't be surprising that we face such high intergenerational attrition dynamics. Yeah. Only 13% were connected to. 87% of client families did not experience what you're preaching here. Just to yeah. build on it, just to strengthen it. That's no, what absolutely. Want. Yeah, super powerful. I appreciate that. That is, uh, that's the reality of it, right? And um, it's why we do a lot of work in that space. The earlier you start, the better, um, you know, for sure. So, so that's, listen, that's what's happening in the marketplace. These are the trends. These are the shifts. This is the stuff we're seeing day in and day out. These are the things that firms are calling us up and asking us for help with. And um, and so I'll kind of shift gears to some of the things you can think about and and apply into your very next conversations, um, you know, here in, in, in your businesses to get some lift and get some opportunity. You know, differentiation in, in this world is, is absolutely critical. And I think we, we, we overlook it a lot of times, right? We, we look at ways internally in which we're different. We sound different, you know, we communicate differently and things of that nature, but like, we have to truly take a, a long stare at this because our, our ability to, our inability, I should say, to not differentiate early on in interactions with a prospective client or center of influence just absolutely prolongs the likelihood of winning that relationship. And so the earlier and the quicker that we can actually show our difference and demonstrate our difference, right? The, the better off we're all gonna be. And that's a lot of the work that we do. We want early interactions to really uh, be and, and be felt as, as very different. Um, you might have been following some of Harvard's work in this space, but you know when we go back in time, when I when I was first starting as a ad young advisor in this business, the people that exceeded and and were the were the top 
performers at that time were these were the athletes that the total drivers when you look at a disc profile right they're like the high d these are the drivers in the world nothing was going to slow them down and all of those things but they they were less about the details and they were more about the speed of getting things done the world is completely shifted 21st century selling is all about relationship the future of this business it comes down to the person that owns the relationship that the relationship is most connected with. And at legacy, we, we kind of think about what was it in the olden days? Well, it was like, regardless of where you came in or wh which way you entered into financial services, the reality is we were given a series of products and we were taught um, how to actually, you know, open up opportunities, disturb people, you know, create gaps and things of that nature so that we could bring those products in. It was it was that whole hammer nail strategy where, you know, you, you get a hammer and everything looks like a nail, right? But the world, as I said, has shifted. And the way that we think about things is instead of bringing our solutions and resources to, to the client, we actually focus first on the client, on the relationship and getting clear on what are their needs? What are their wants? What are their desires? Now, in my world, I have lots of advisors that say to me, well, that's what we do. And I said, well, let's walk through what that experience actually looks and sounds like and feels like. Pretend I'm a prospect. Let's talk about it. And the hard reality is, unless you are really dialed in on this and you are continuously honing on your craft, before too long, we're starting to get in a direction of sounding just like everybody else, right? And, and that's kind of the challenge. How do we develop and build skills, right? And techniques and tools where we have the confidence and the capabilities to actually stay more in the conversation about getting clear on what matters to the people. Um, and again, that's that's kind of our world at Legacy where we bring that behavioral stuff and, and Bento, hey. right? Like, <laughs> Uh, two ideas, two ideas there. Number one, I'm a simple guy, so I like to simplify things. Looking at these two approaches, it seems to me that the traditional one on the left is a push-based approach, and the new one on the right is a pull-based approach. That's at least how, you know, I mental model it out. Yeah. And then the second comment I would have is, in case you're wondering what, you know, approach you're actually pursuing as an advisor, perhaps in the next meeting, try to stop time and measure who is talking how much. In the olden days, advisors used to talk a lot on the left. In the new model, I hope you concur, Todd, that's absolutely flipped. The yeah. more the client shares, the better. A hundred percent. I I sometimes call it the lunch test or the dinner test, depending if you're meeting with prospects or clients over lunch or dinner. The, the whole plan should be that you end the you end that lunch or dinner period with a full plate of food in front of you. And and that really is just going to tell you that you you've you've been you've been listening the whole entire time and you're so busy listening that you don't have time to eat. Right. It's it's just. Yeah. hundred percent. And we just need to shift our focus on it. The thing that I tell people is it's not that scary and it's not that hard. These are just a lot of natural conversations and it's not the way that we were taught in in kind of the traditional approaches coming into the business. So, um, but there's ways to do it. We'll talk about trust a little bit here quickly, and then I want to tie this into you, Philip, and Bento and the team there because I think there's something critical here at the end of this. Uh, again, as I said earlier, trust is something that is misunderstood. It it's it's uh, it's it's poorly executed on, and it's not your fault. I think we just get inundated with the stuff, and we really never think about our words, our actions, the activities, and the things that we're doing, and and how does that build or take away from trust? So we're huge on everything we do, and the formula I'm going to share you with in the next slide. Everything we do, every script we create, everything we help advisors do, we take that formula into consideration. You got to have a process around it. You've got to involve your entire team, big or small. Everyone needs to buy in and understand. And then you got to really be deliberate about it. I have met amazing people in my career, right? Amazing people that care so much, but you know what? They don't build trust well. And, and again, it's not because they're bad people doing the wrong things. Well, in fact, they, they're they just not focused on the right things. And so it's minor shifts 
and minor modifications that allow them to then just do trust powerfully and have people moving closer to them. So I'm going to share this with you. Um, and this isn't this isn't something I came up with. This is from a book called The Trusted Advisor. Uh, David Maester, Charlie Green, Al, I think it's Al Galford. I came across this book 20 plus years ago in my business. I've read it probably 15 times. Um, anyways, they have a formula in there, which is around trust, mathematical formula. Again, uh, I'll kind of walk you through it. The, st the C stands for our credibility, the, the level of credibility we have. The R stands for reliability, right? How reliable we are. The I stands for intimacy, okay? Each of these are measured on a scale of one to 10. So if I'm a 10, right, across the board, I'm highly credible. We've been highly reliable in the relationship. And we've got a high degree of professional intimacy, meaning the client sharing things with me that they've never shared with another financial advisor. We, we, we have to um, crawl before we can walk, before we can run on this trust thing. What I tell people is, and, and each of you that are listening in here today, you've had a conversation. And some of you um, that have been doing this for a long time have had multiples where you left that meeting and you were like, wow. The client left your office or you left lunch or whatever it was. And you were like, wow, I can't believe they just said that. I can't believe they just actually shared that with me, right? We've all had one of those moments, but how can you replicate that time and time again? Because the more they share and the more that they feel safe and open sharing, they don't want to recreate those types of relationships ever again, okay? And I'm going to tell you how you do that whether consciously or unconsciously, what you actually did was you mastered this denominator here, the S. The S stands for self-interest or self-orientation. And this is the extent to which this client or prospect feels like I'm more interested in what I get out of this relationship versus what I'm putting into it and what they're getting out of it. So unfortunately, Financial services, there's a lot of mistrust, okay? We're managing people's finances. We're managing their wealth. There's a lot of people that have done a lot of bad things. And so we have to think about how does that influence us? I tell my clients all the time, my advisor clients, every one of your best clients is somebody else's best prospect, several other advisors' best prospects. So everybody that is agreeing to meet with you is coming from somewhere. You have to think about the self-orientation carryover into a new relationship. So when I go back and say, listen, you've all met with somebody and you've had that meeting, that moment where you were like, wow, I can't believe they just did that. Why did that happen? Why can't we recreate that to happen right away in every situation? It's like, because people trust differently, right? It happens at, at different paces and in different ways. It just, there's no silver bullet. I have people ask me all the time, what's the one question I can ask? There isn't one. You have to lower your self-orientation. You have to make sure that they know it's all about them and it's very little about you. You're just the guide to help them get there. But if you reinforce that constantly, it is the trigger to intimacy, right? When you do it consistently and long enough, and sometimes it'll happen fast, it's the trigger to intimacy and they will open up and eventually start telling you everything. You got to be reliable. You have to be credible and all of those things, no doubt about it. But I'm telling you right now, self-interest is the trigger of trust and relationships. Okay. So anyways, I think that when we think about that, you know, Philip, and I think about Bento, right? what you've built, what you've created on the self-interest and, and serving clients, right? In a way that it's about their needs and, and things of that nature. I, I can't say that this is, there's more perfect spot for you here than to kind of show what, what you're doing and, and share the platform. I would appreciate that handover, appreciate that context. If you stop sharing, I will speak for a minute and then pull up a demo instance of Bento itself. By way of context, Bento is a integrated technology and content solution that kind of does what Todd is suggesting. It helps client-centric advisors to proactively engage and serve all of their clients and prospects during moments that matter. 
What are these moments that matter, you may wonder? It's 15 age-based milestones from zero all the way to 73 RMDs that really matter because they trigger distinct wealth management risks or opportunities by law. 50 catch-up contributions, 62, the big question, do you start so taking social security benefits now or later? 70 and a half, if you're philanthropically inclined, QCDs, you get the joke. In addition, there's life events, getting married, divorced, ha having a child, moving to Florida, buying a business or selling a home. If you overlay the 15 age-based milestones and dozens of life events, think of Bento as providing dozens of opportunities to proactively engage and serve your clients all along their client life cycle. And Todd, tying back to the trust theme, I hope you agree there are hardly any better ways to demonstrate how much you're intimate, how much you're client-centric, how much you care, than to proactively alert your clients and prospects of upcoming opportunities, yeah. giving them advice and education, and giving them the courtesy of time to think about it and make informed decisions without having some fake negative sense of urgency behind it. That's the thrust. How that works, let me pop over into a CRM and bring it to life. On the note of CRM, we integrate into Redtail, Wealthbox, Practify, Accelerate, Dynamics, Salesforce, you know, all the big CRMs out there. We <clears> constantly <throat> mine the data in the CRM to identify upcoming advice opportunities. When we find one, we pull the right content from our proprietary purpose-built content library, and then very proactively, we alert you via a task or activity in your CRM, and we equip you with compliance pre-approved content coming in multiple formats for you to execute with. How that looks and feels like, let's take a look. I am screen sharing. Can you all see a Salesforce instance building up? Wonderful. Same advisor experience in Redtail, Wealthbox, whatever else you might be using. Todd, you're our advisor today. It's Monday morning after your third cup of coffee. You fire up your CRM. And given that you're well-trained by legacy, given that you are half-organized, you'll go to your task list, your to-dos for the day. As you can see here, some of the tasks have nothing to do with Bento Engine, everything to do with your regular course of business. But then you also see these age-based alerts these life events, these children wealth activities in your CRM, those indeed were pushed by Bento into your CRM, giving you the age point, the advice opportunity, and who it pertains to. If for whatever reason you do not want to advise Susie on how to think about Medicare as she's approaching 65, no problem. You just delete the task and move on with your day. If, however, let's say age 50 for Janet catches your eye, Janet is a great client of yours, you haven't spoken to her in a while, then you follow this link to this standard alert structure. The structure is always the same. Hey, your good client Janet is about to turn 50 in six months time. In case you haven't had a chance yet to advise on catch-up contributions, now would be a good time. And then we give you links to compliance pre-approved content coming in multiple formats. I'll bring that to life in a second. We always wrap it up with best practices to consider. Oftentimes, our micro-engagements can serve as a ramp into more fulsome financial planning. And last but not least, we build a mental bridge to the monetizable solutions that may matter in this dialogue. You taught as the advisor can now say, Thank you, CRM, for that helpful heads up. I was close to forgetting that client number 248 is about to turn 50. Janet belongs to the 60 plus percent of Americans who are visual learners, who benefit from looking at a well-structured PowerPoint or PDF page. In that case, you would follow link number three or four and access the PDF version of the advice. And boom, some ready-to-go materials pop up for you. Todd, can you see this PDF page on H50? Wonderful. Yep. The Beautiful. materials are always short and sweet, a page or two. They always cover the what, the why, and the how. 
what are catch-up contributions? Why bother? What's the economic benefit of getting this right? Another way to think about it, Todd, down here on the right, what is the demonstrable value add that you as the advisor bring to the table by leaning in on this topic at this point in time? Last not least, action steps. How do you actually implement and get it done? On the last page, we keep everybody safe. Disclaimers, quality further reading, underlying US tax code, current as of to preempt a potential question. Yes, of course, for our larger partner firms, we can white label, we can brand the materials in your look and feel. Now, Todd, as you well know, not everybody is a visual learner. Some clients actually don't like to look at PowerPoint pages. They just mm. want to have a conversation instead. In that case, you would follow link number two and access the talking points version of the advice, which help you to frame the conversation and then spoon feed to you the key messages to relay in a impactful dialogue on the topic at hand. If your client Janet is the constantly on the go type, you know, living in her email box and you want to fire off an email to get things going, we've got you covered. All you would do here in this email is customize the red intro and outro. The rest is compliance pre-approved and locked. Last but not least, Todd, if it's been a while since you last advised on making catch-up contributions, if you as the advisor need a refresher yourself, then you would follow the link to the internal use only advisor FAQs. Think of these as a cheat sheet for the back pocket of the advisor. Organized around the what, the why, and the how, these are our most technical documents, simple FAQ style, and if your eyes are very good, here our subject matter experts always cite the underlying US tax code so that everybody can backtrace what is the advice actually based on. So yes, there is a strong advisor learning and development, a strong training aspect on all these important wealth planning topics baked into the system. There you have it, Todd. I hope you agree. Deep bi-directional integration into your CRM mining the data, identifying upcoming advice opportunities, and then not only alerting you, but also equipping you with compliance pre-approved content for you to execute with. All designed for you to lead with advice during crucial moments that matter on the life journeys of your clients and prospects. And Todd, I hope you concur. When advisors do that, everybody benefits not only better client experiences and outcomes, but also organic business growth via the loyalty, the referral rate, and the share of wallet deepening that Todd mentioned earlier. That's the tie between the future of advice, the way that Todd sees it, and how Bento Engine is a scalable, efficient solution to help advisors today to live that future at scale. With that, let me pause, hand back over to you, Todd, to round out the story, and let's keep a few minutes at the end for Q&A. Sounds good, Philip. I, I, you know, what's interesting is the one, I don't know if you said this earlier, but, um, you know, I, I go back to, um, you know, the fact that I think you talked about reliability. I think you talked about intimacy, self-orientation, but the one piece I don't even think you talked about was credibility, right? You look at the knowledge base that Bento has built that's fueled right into my CRM for educational purposes, communications, all. I, I don't know how advisors live without a tool like that. So um, yeah, I, I love it. I think it's beautiful. Um, Let's uh, let's keep going here. I, I know somebody had asked in the chat, you know, listen, there's a number of ways in which, um, you know, how, well, they asked plain and simply, how do we differentiate, right? Like, what's the best way to differentiate or what is the one or two best ways? In, in my world, um, we created something that we call the planning horizon. This has been the most powerful differentiator, whether you're, you know, sitting, having a glass of wine, waiting for people for dinner, maybe, and you strike up conversation with somebody and you got to have a quick conversation on a napkin or something while you're sitting, waiting, 
or you know, in a in a, another form of a meeting, really wherever you find yourself, um, we found this to be a super super important differentiator, a powerful differentiator. So the planning horizon, as you can see, creates two very distinctive realms: what's above and what's below that planning horizon. The areas below are all around the strategies, tactics, and tools. It's all about how do we act, how could we actually help you? Who would we need to actually get on the team and get aligned? And then when's the best and right appropriate time to solve it? The hard reality is, is that this is either where most advisors start their conversations to try and help and advise, or they're in a race to get there because this is where most of the compensation comes and things of that nature. And so when you're talking with people, you can bet a lion's share percentage of the time. These are the types of experiences they're having today. They have lots of people around them that are advising them about things they should do or consider doing or change in what it is they've done. However, what I'd urge you to say is that in my work, we actually start at a different place and that place is up above the horizon. And we start by really understanding what is it that our clients value? What's the actual vision you have for the future or even this specific thing that we're talking about here today? And then what are the goals that are actually we can put in place that are going to move you closer and closer to that vision while respecting your values along the way? I would urge you to go on to say that, you know, from a below the horizon standpoint, there's probably not a technique or strategy or something that I couldn't help you put in place. But the reality is, is that putting that in place before I understand where you've been, and more importantly, where do you want to actually go? It's like putting the cart before the horse, wouldn't you say? Anyways, that framing of a conversation around this amazing differentiator, the most miss, the, 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 the highest uh, underserved element of relationship is around values, visions, and goals. And, you know, that's why at Legacy, we've we've chosen that as our, uh, our focal point of teaching advisors to do that in a streamlined way, powerfully, profitably, um, and, you know, and, and impactfully. So, it, you know, it's funny, you think about this, and Philip just said this, why he and I are kind of two peas in a pod. He's absolutely right. 65% of the, the people around us, right? They process information by what they see. They're visual processors. Another 30% are auditory processors. So we have to have good tangible pictures with our words. And when we can align both, we're hitting 95% of the population, right? In a very, very powerful way. So this is a, this is a planning horizon story is a thing that we teach people to draw, share, anywhere. I don't care where you are. I've had advisors send me pictures when they were sitting on the beach, right? On a beautiful beach, they met somebody, they struck up conversation and they're drawing this in the sand using a shell or a stick, right? It's, it's something you can do and do anywhere, but to differentiate powerfully and quickly. Um, Philip mentioned our book, The Right Side of the Table, uh, we 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 wrote it in 07. My my late brother Scott and I, we still sell tons and tons of these books. What's crazy about it is even though it's 07, the things that we wrote about then, because of our crystal ball that we have here at Legacy, are actually happening today. It's amazing. So it's still very, very relevant. Um, and and if anybody wants a copy, I'd just reach out to us and I'd be happy to get a copy off to you. Um, but in that, we talk about this whole concept of the planning table and becoming the client's trusted advisor. How do we get ourselves aligned on the client's side of the table, which in our world is the right side of the table? And the reality is that in the, you know, in the context of a client relationship, and maybe this is a, a, a more elaborate or complicated one, there's people that are sitting on different sides of the table that are bringing different skills and different approaches to that relationship. We've got people across the table from the client in a sales model. And then we've got people on the ends of the table and the advice style model. And then again, going back to Aristotle, that advisor on the client side of the table is really bringing more of a discerning based approach to engagements and how they engage and how they help and serve. And, and then aligning that with all the other advisors on the client's team. So this is um, a powerful way for you to be able to substantiate 
who's actually sitting on the client's table today or around the client's table today, but also an opportunity for you to talk about the role and the relationship you want to have and play, um, you know, with clients. So very, very, very powerful tool. Um, hey, Todd, I, it's plenty yeah. of stakeholders around that table by design. If I may suggest one addition, yeah. it's G2 and three, at least mentally. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, they they absolutely need to be at the table. Um, I won't talk about Qualitate uh, today. This is just a fintech that we've developed here at Legacy to document a lot of the stuff I've talked about with clients. Um, but for time's sake, I, I I won't I won't go into that today. Just really quickly, because this ties into what Philip was talking about. We need to enhance our client experiences, and and I want to get into this thing that we call the touch point plan, because what what Philip and his team at Bento have built. When you look at this touch point plan that we've created and we help our clients develop their own custom versions of it, my goodness, I'm watching him go through the Bento demo and I'm like, man, that fuels the whole touch point plan with clients. We build our client experience around decisions that are our clients, business owners, wealth holders, what have you are making, right? And so the first one is people have to agree to meet with us. People have to agree to engage and hire us. People have to commit to their goals. And by commit, I mean, sign off and say, yeah, this is what we want. This is our priority. And then the fourth is people have to commit to implement. And so what we've done is actually socialize that in a workflow. So, you know, Bento is incorporated into many of the top CRMs for financial advisors to use. And, and really, this is where you would workflow that client experience. So this is the kind of work that we're doing inside of firms to really get down to the nitty gritty. I mean, I've had client advisory firms and teams be so excited about e even a template for a simple letter that we could provide them that simply is, is how they welcome a new client relationship into the business, right? Little things like that. We've created a lot of templates and workflows and things of that nature, but when you think about wanting to create world-class client experiences, you have to get down to really the nitty gritty of what is that process? What's the steps? Who's doing what when we think about the team? And then this last piece, just to share, and then we can open it up and see if there's some questions here, is this touch point plan. So this is after you maybe would go through a segmentation or revamp your segmentation in the business. And this is all the ways in which we want to touch clients throughout the year. So think about Bento's play in this and Bento's role in this, right? There's obviously touch points around the onboarding process, a ways in which we want to communicate with them throughout the year. I mean, Bento plays a significant role in that. In fact, it's working for you, right? It's like a, it's like an employee, that thing. It's a couple of employees, really good ones. Um, how do we want to educate them? Bento plays a significant role in that. And then, you know, we think about appreciation and the annual review. So we're doing this for firms across their segments of clients that they want to serve and putting very purposeful strategy, time horizons, responsibilities to team members and things of that nature. Because again, if we want to create world-class, you know, firms and experiences for our clients and continue to achieve growth goals, you know, this is really the type of stuff that we need to put in place. So they taught uh, as we, as, yeah. as you wrap up with that part, can you go back to the prior page? Yes, sure. Super interesting framework and helpful tool for many advisors out there on the lines, tying it to your opening comments around the importance of client segmentations. Am I right to interpret that columns A, B, C are different, you know, segments in a firm that then experience slightly different segment specific client touch plans? Is that the way 100%. to read this? Yep, 100%. Yeah, perfectly Super helpful. That, and with that, that over to you for 30 seconds to wrap up your spiel. And then we did have some questions coming in, some great ones. Mark okay. will share those with us in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Let's get to that. I mean, at the end of the day, this is really it. It's, uh, you know, I, I believe that people won't remember what we said or what we did, but they'll always remember how we made them feel. And this is this is the thing. We go back to relationship. What's at the center of it? How do you do it? Make those memorable moments. And um, that's really what's important here today. So uh, I appreciate the time and appreciate being with the group. And let's 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 segue to some questions here, um, you know, for time's sake that have come in, please. Indeed. Mark, if you don't mind sharing the questions that came in, we had some great ones coming in to us as hosts. 
Mark, fire away, and Todd and I will answer the best we can. Sure. The first one I have is actually on the bento side. How long does it take to onboard or integrate bento into the CRM and into the office? Great question. Frankly speaking, it depends on what CRM you're using. If you happen to be using something like Wealthbox or Redtail, they have very open, modern APIs. You can actually go to our website, bentoengine.com, click a install now button and do the whole integration in 20 minutes or less self-directed on your own timeline. If you work in a large enterprise that probably uses something like Salesforce or Dynamics, the onboarding work we would have to do with your central tech team is two meetings, two, three hours in total to get going on the tech side of things. Excellent. And uh, that does actually answer another question that came in. Does Bento integrate with Redtail? Quick answer, yes. Very seamless. One of our, our featured partners. Uh, that actually then dovetails into another question on the pricing side, Philip. Pricing is very transparent, available at the pricing tab on our website, bentoengine.com. It is seat-based licenses. The exact pricing depends on the number of content programs you purchase and the number of seats, roughly speaking, order of magnitude, a thousand bucks a seat a year for Bento Engine, allowing you to shine with proactive advice. Excellent. Excellent. And now, Todd, one for you. Where can people learn more about Legacy and learn more about you? Yeah, please. Um, you know, you can go to our, our website, um, which is there on the screen. Just think hyphen legacy dot com. Um, you can get in touch with you can read about us, learn about what we do and get in touch with our team there. Book some time if you want to have a consultation. We, we'd love to uh, love to chat. Excellent. Excellent. Anything else, Mark? Uh, nothing just yet, but anyone feel free to shoot out any questions or as part of the follow up. You can follow up with Philip, with Todd, or myself. We'd be happy to answer those questions as they come up. Super. Let's wrap it up slightly ahead of time. Todd, can't thank you enough for joining this conversation and sharing your interesting perspectives on the future of advice. I hope that our audience learned as much as we did. Mark, thank you for keeping us on track from an ops point of view. In terms of learning more, think legacy.com and bentoengine.com on our end. Thank you all for your interest and let's keep on leading with advice. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you everybody.